Good Sukkot, good Moed, welcome to my share. This share is being given uh, on Sukkot, it's about a Sukkot theme, and it's sponsored by Susan Grayson in memory of her mother, Ruth Kanowitz Davidov, Rus Bas Moshe Yona HaKoyen, Zechren Levrocha, whose yard site is on the 19th of Tishrei. The Neshama should have an aliyah, we should be zeichet to see Tchias HaMesim. We're going to be talking about Arba Minim, but we're going to be talking about many topics today. As you can see, I've got my little Esroigim uh, Hadassim arrangement here on my on my desk. A beautiful scent, I have to tell you. It's really a, a pleasure to be giving the share today with this gorgeous scent of the combination of the Esroigim and Hadassim here on my desk. L'kachtem l'chem b'yom arishon pre-eitz hodo kapois t'mar v'anafes ovois v'arbe nocha. So the posuk. Um, in Emma, he gives us a bit of a cryptic um, reference to all of the Arba Minim. We don't actually know what they are based on what it says in the Torah. We have to be told that Gemara, and this is, of course, Torah Shabal Peh, tells us what the four things are. So the first one is pre uh, and and there's a uh, two translations. You could have a pre Hodor. Either it's the uh, fruit of a beautiful tree or it's a beautiful fruit from a tree, pre harder. Either way, it doesn't matter. We know it's Estrog. I wrote about it. If you've not read my piece or heard the uh, audio of the piece that I wrote just before Sukkot, please uh, listen to it or read it because it will tell you a lot of information about the origins of the Estrog, which in fact I, I will give a little bit away. The Estrog originally comes from China, which is where all citrus fruits originate. Uh, and I give a bit of a history there of how it made its way across to the Middle East, to where its Israel is, of course, now... Uh, and we use the estrog. The estrogs used today, the only reason the estrog exists today is because Orthodox Jews Jews use lulav and estrog and they, they need an estrog. Otherwise, it has no other use. There's nobody else who's interested in estrogim. It doesn't grow anywhere in any decorative gardens and uh, it has no use as a fruit. The only use for it in its existence is the fact that Jewish people use it on Sukkot. That's the first one. Priya Toda Kapois Tamorim. We know Tamorim are. Tamorim is a date palm. So we know that it is the Kapois Tamorim, uh, is the very straight ramrod, straight lulav that comes, shoots out through the, at the top of the palm tree before it spreads out and becomes a palm frond. It is uh, used as a lulav. That's the other one. The next one. Anaf eats ovois. The Arbe Nochal. Anaf eats ovois. Very. Uh, a weird a combination of words. I'm not going to translate it even. We know it means hadassim. These are hadassim. They have to be in a particular form. They, they must be three leaves um, going down sequentially down the stalk. And it's a myrtle. That's what it is. That's what hadassim are. Then we have arve nochal, which is the willow, the willow branches. And uh, willow, by the way, was a ubiquitous tree in any, any place where there was running water uh, and existed uh, across the known world. Um, a myrtle is, is a little bit more uh, exclusive. It didn't really exist everywhere. Uh, and, um, well, these are the four species that we use and we shake them, we hold them together. The estrog in our left hand, if you're, left, if you're right-handed, if you're, if you're left-handed, you should hold the estrog in your right hand. But the estrog and the lulav hadassim and arovas in the other hand, and we shake them um, and we make a brocha on them, alnatilas lulav, and that is... The mitzvah in the Torah that could be found in Parshas Emor. Now, listen. It says straight away afterwards, Usmachtem lifnei Hashem elokeichem. That you use these, um, these Arba Minim to be joyous, to be happy in front of Hashem. So the Medrash picks up on these very curious uh, species that we use and about the fact that Usmachtem lifnei Hashem elokeichem. And this is what the Medrash says. It's in Vayikra Rabba. You can look it up. Rabbi Mani Posach, Rabbi Mani began uh, his drosha on Sukkot as follows. Kol atzmoisai temarna Hashem yichomoicha. It's a posuk in Tehillim, in Perik Lamad Hei, posuk Yud. The posuk says, Kol atzmoisai temarna, all my bones will speak out, will say, Hashem yichomoicha, God, who is like you? That's the posuk, an odd posuk, because your bones don't speak. And by the way, atzmoisa in this context probably doesn't just mean bones. It means every aspect of my body or every important aspect of my body uh, will speak out and say, Hashem micha moicha. So, loy neemar posuk ze elo bishvil lulav says Rav Mani that this posuk 
is speaking specifically about the lulav. But you're going to see it's not just the lulav, it's the lulav and the accompanying species, uh, the Esrei, the Hadassim and the Arovas. The shedra of the lulav, the spine of the lulav, is identical or can be um, cross-identified with the spine of a human being. Truth is, not quite, because the spine, as we know, is made up of multiple bones, whereas the shedra of the lulav, in fact, connects all the leaves. It's, um, uh, it's fused all the way to the top, and the leaves are the bits that separate separate each other um, from each other. But, but nevertheless, the idea is that you've got this ramrod straight shedra in the lulav, and similarly, an upright human being. And by the way, what, um, what is the unique aspect of the human condition? We walk upright. And uh, there are other animals that do walk upright. Specifically, there are apes and bears that do stand on their hind feet. But it's not uh, as a matter of course. Then there's the, uh, an animal in Australia called uh, um, a kangaroo. Or it could be a wallaby. They also are upright, although they use their tails for balance. We don't have a tail to use for balance. We walk upright. And what holds us upright is our backs, is our spine. And that's what distinguishes us, makes us distinct from all other animals. Says Rabbi Mani, the lulav is to tell, and this is the source of everything that we learnt. You know, when we learnt about Arbaminim, you're going to see there's other things that we learnt about Arbaminim as children. This idea that the shedra is the same as the spine of the human skeleton is something which is, in fact, a very deep idea. And that's what you're going to see. I'm learning the Nesiva Sholem here. You're going to see the Nesiva Sholem really expands on this idea. So it's not just some random connection between the bones of the skeleton and, uh, and the shedra of the lulav, but there's something much deeper going on here. Listen carefully. Now we go to the other, the others, uh, the other species, the other ones of the minim, hadahadas, the myrtle, if you look at the little leaves of the myrtle, you see that they are in the same shape as a human eye. The arava domelape, the arava, the leaf of the arava is the same as the mouth. The esrig domelalev and the esrig, you can see it's the same shape, more or less, as a human heart. Omar David. So David HaMelech in Tehillim is telling us as follows. Ein b'chol ha'ivarim godal me'elu. All of the limbs or all of the aspects of the human body, there's no greater ones than these four. They are really, they can be measured against the entire body. That means you cannot function without these four. These are the most important, the most prominent of all the aspects of the human body. These are the ones that are most important. Again, spine, the eye or eyes, the heart and the mouth. You're going to see more as we go on. And this is the Medrash Ad Khan. This is the Medrash and what it says. These Dalad Minim, which correlate to these four aspects of the human body, and the Ikriim, these are the most important aspects of the human body. So when the Posik says, even though the eye is not strictly a bone, nevertheless, it's, it's a broad term that's used to include all of these four aspects of the human body. And through these four, we can say all of these four, if used in a particular way, are expressing this idea of Hashem Micha Meicha, God, who is like you. It says in the Siva Shalom, we really need to understand this a little bit more deeply. We need to go into it. Why do we need to, if anything, um, why do we need to do this mitzvah particularly on Sukkot? I'll, I'll expand on his question. If it's true, it's very important that we express this idea of Hashem Micha Meicha through using these four minim. Why don't we have a mitzvah to do it every day? It's a good question, right? If it's so important, why is it specifically connected to Sukkot and only to Sukkot. So you're going to say we maybe should do it on the other Chagim. Okay, why don't we do it on Shavuos? Why don't we do it on Pesach? Why specifically on Sukkot do we shake, do we use the Arba Minim that have this um, 
correlation with Kolatz Moisei Toimarna. Kein Tzorich Bia, and he asks another question, We also need to understand, what is this concept that's being conveyed by the Posuk? Because immediately after talking about the Arba Minim, and mentioning them in the Torah and Pasha Semar, we talk about the fact that you have to be joyous in front of God. Why is this using these Arba Minim? Why does it somehow mean that we are celebrating, that we are joyous, that we are happy? In um, in front of God, she is can inyon meyuchet shal simcha lidei netilas talad minim because clearly using the arba minim, using them properly, understanding what they mean, is going to assist us in celebrating and in being happy in front of Hashem. But Abir, here's the explanation. Dina isa b'teras ovois he quotes teras ovois she ikar havoid by yom norim lamluchei kutsh brichu akol eva veeva delay. Let's understand that if you're going to look at the yom norim. The most important aspect of the Yom Noraim, in fact, it's the key aspect that kicks off our davening on Rosh Hashanah, is to coronate, to establish the kingship, the royal status of God. What's the first thing that we do in Rosh Hashanah? Musaf, Malchius, then Zichronus and Shifras. The idea is that we need to have this feeling that God is king. I have to tell you that it's something that us in modernity find difficulty with because we don't have a concept of a human king anymore. The vast majority of the developed world, we have this idea of democracy. Yes, there's power, but it's not absolute power as existed uh, in the case of kings. Uh, You know that kings were born into a particular family and each king or queen sometimes, they had absolute power over the people uh, that uh, that were under them, that they ruled over. And that is a concept that's very foreign to us because you know that if we don't like the people who rule us, we have an opportunity whenever there's, there is an election to elect somebody else to vote in another leader. That, I, that idea didn't exist in ancient times. But if you want to understand what God is, God is the ruler, the omnipotent ruler of the universe. We are all in his power. That's the concept of God. So we have to establish on Rosh Hashanah, and it goes all the way through to Yom Kippur, and we begin on Rosh Hashanah by establishing this hierarchy that God is above everything, so that we understand that when we get to Yom Kippur and we're asking for Teshuvah, having prepared throughout the Aseret Yimei Teshuvah, that we understand who it is that we're asking for forgiveness from. And it's it, Hashem is the Melech. We say Hashem Melech, Hashem Moloch, Hashem Yimloch, Elam Void. We repeat it many times. The concept of Melucha is something which is central. It's a theme of Yomim Naroim, of the 10 days that begin on Rosh Hashanah at the end with Yom Kippur. Vehine, Avoida Zu, Higam Bechaga Sukkot. So we have to establish God's Melucha over every one of our Evorim, every one of our physical elements. On Rosh Hashanah through to the end of Yom Kippur. But it's something, says the Nesiva Sholem, that carries through to Sukkot as well. But there's a difference. Shem, but you're going to see in a minute. Shem itoich kach mevatel eskola avorim l'Hashem Yisborach. Sorry. V'ayini ha'avoyda zu higam b'chag ha'sukkot elo. B'yomim ha'noroim ha'avoyda hi b'midas ha'yira. What is it that we need to do on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? We need to establish God's a complete control over us. But in a way, it's a theoretical idea. And it's done through this feeling of awe that we need to establish, that we need to hold God in such incredible esteem that we are awed by him. The word yira is not fear. Uh, I know that that's the way it's often translated into English. The word yira means awe. And it's something which is awe-inspiring. That means when we see it, we're completely overwhelmed in its presence. That's what all means. For example, when, when you meet somebody who is incredibly talented, they can play a musical instrument in a way that you've never seen anybody play a musical instrument before. You're in awe of their incredible talent. You meet somebody that's huge. I know you've met people who are big, six foot two, six foot three. Two. Then you meet someone who's six foot eight and well built and extremely strong. You're in awe of that person's strength. The concept of Yiras Shamayim is that you have to be in awe of God, understand the incredible presence and kingship, uh, the, the, um, the status that God has 
as the king and ruler of the universe, and then you will be in awe of that. That's the avoider of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And that we call that Midas Hayira. Ella, um, as a result of having that feeling, once you know that God is all powerful, then you, it will nullify any feelings of power that you have over yourself. You're not going to think about the fact, oh, I can do this, I can do that, if you understand that God can do anything. Again, let's put it in human terms. Even if you are a piano player, but you meet somebody who's a much, much better piano player than you, an awesome piano player, you're not going to immediately, um, after they've played the piano and they've just played Rachmaninoff, go to the piano and pay, play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. You're going to recognize that whatever it is you can play on the piano pales into complete insignificance. It's irrelevant next to the, the awesome talent of the piano player who's just played Rachmaninoff. So in that context, you will know once you've established the awesomeness of God, that anything that you can do is completely irrelevant. So your mevatel, that's the word that the Nesiva Shalom use, uses, you are mevatel es kolay varim l'ashem barach. Everything that you have is just an extension, as it were, of God. And the little things that you can do uh, are of little significance next to what it is that God does. Okay. Now, now that you've established that principle, now you come to sukkus. Sukkus, you, you come at this same idea, but the, what you're drawing from is not yira, but love. Ahava, love. Umarumas b'mamar hakosuv, lekachtem lochem b'yoyim harishrein. This concept of love is hinted at in the first, in the Pasuk, where it says, that you take the Arba Minim on the first day. What's B'yom Arishon? Remember that each one of the seven days of Sukkot has a correlating individual from the Torah. Who, who are they? Avram Yitzhak Yaakov, Moshe Aaron, Yosef David. Those are the seven that are included with each day of Sukkot. So the first day of Sukkot is Avraham. Who is Avraham? Says the um, Nesiva Shalom. You have Marishan who connected Midas HaChesed Midasay Shel Avraham Avinu Alav Shalom. So you have to know that Avraham Avinu is the ultimate representation in human form of kindness, of loving kindness. Ahava, this concept of love, which is expressed through Chesed, that's who Avraham Avinu is, and that's the first day of Sukkot, because he's the Ishbizin on the first day of Sukkot. What is it? What are you doing when you're being kind? If you know that God only put you on this world to be kind to others, and you are kind to others, and not selfish, but selfless, then do you know what you're doing? You're being mevatel, your evorim, everything about your human body, to Hashem. If I give charity, I'm taking of myself and giving it to someone else, Essentially, I am an extension of God. I am allowing God to act through me. That is the middle of Ahava acting itself out through the human condition, through the human being. And that's what you're doing. Now, the truth is, for most of the year, it's very difficult as the year wears on and our needs become ever more evident. Don't forget, we're heading into the winter. And this idea that in the winter we need to hunker down, we need to uh, have fire or heat so that we can keep ourselves warm. We need to eat so that we can have the energy to function. That's what the winter is. The winter is when we don't have anything and we need to have everything for ourselves. And as the year wears on, we kind of forget this concept of chesed because we're being selfish. Selfish for self-preservation reasons, but selfish. So it's difficult for us, if we weren't conscious of it, to carry out this idea of being mevatel our evorim through ahava, through doing good things. So that's why we have sukkahs. That's why we have sukkahs just before the winter. You're going to see. The fact is, we allow sin to... Uh, interfere with the with our desire to do mitzvahs. You know what? We want to do mitzvahs, but somehow we don't end up doing them and we use our body for all the wrong reasons. So now we have this brief opportunity, this window of time, 
after the Yom Norahim, which is the end of the harvest season, and before the onset of the winter, we have this little period of time, this window of time, which we can utilize to give ourselves a boost in terms of using everything that we have for the purposes of serving God's will. That's what it's all about. Le'acha yomim noroim, ha'vayoyim kod ha'kodosh, after yomim noroim, the Aseris Mechuvan, particularly Yom Kippur, asher b'yoyim hazeh Yehudi netar legamre. What do we do on Yom Kippur? We completely shed ourselves of any type of physical material desires. We fast, we pray, we we commune together as a group to to uh, feel the spirituality of the moment. That is a very holy and special day. And what do you know? Do you know what we do? We cleanse ourselves. It's a cleanse. It's a rehabilitation day. It's a day when we completely rehabilitate ourselves spiritually. That's what we are doing. As it says in the Pasuk, That's what it means. The whole concept of Yom Kippur is to purify ourselves. The end of Yom Kippur, you're ready for every single part of your human body to say, Hashem Micha Micha. You're ready for it at the end of Yom Kippur. But how are you going to do it? And soon enough, it's going to wear off. So what do you do? That's exactly why we have the four species. That's why we have them. It's, the, it's an elevated reason that exists for the Arba Minim so that we can take this feeling, this purification that we've had on Yom Kippur and turn it into something real, into something meaningful. They somehow uh, um, relate to all the different aspects of the human body that are really important, the elevated aspects in terms of the physical body, and we turn them into something which which is um, demonstrating the concept of Hashem Micha Moicha. So in Yom Yom we do it in a theoretical way, in a praying way, or by desisting from the material, and on Sukkot it's the opposite. We take these things and we energize them, we infuse them with this concept of Do you know what? There's no greater joy. There is no greater contentment for the neshama and ultimately the body than a person who is You need to know that. The, the feeling that you have, the level of spiritual satisfaction that you gain if you do something for the sake of God, is something that has no comparison in any other sphere of the human condition. None. If a Jewish person, a person who has a person of faith, is able to nullify them, their all the physical material aspects for the sake of God and to show their love of God, he will have fulfilled, he will have discharged his duty, but more than that, he will have ultimately realized the tanug, the delight, the pleasure of God. It is more than any of the tanugim, the pleasures that you can have in this world. That is the pleasure of of communing with God, of connecting to God, of feeling that you have done God's work and God's will. So now we have a direct relationship between the Arba Minim, Lulav Esra Kadasim and Arovas, and joy and simcha and happiness. And now we have another aspect of what it says in Torah's Ovas that can be further understood. There is a posuk. The posuk says, throw your bread onto the face of the water, onto the water, throw it into the water. And in the fullness of time, you will find it. What, what is lachmacho? Lachem, lachem is bread. What does it mean? Bread is the ultimate form of food. It gives you energy right away. It's a staple food. It's something which is central to every meal. And the idea is that ta'avo, human desire, that, well, really it's the animal desire that exists within a human being uh, in terms of food, is incredibly well demonstrated by the, um, by the food item bread. Bread 
is the ultimate form of desire. And Sukkot is a water festival. You know that we had Nisuch HaMayim every day in the Beis HaMikdosh. Every single day they poured water. I means large quantities of water were poured onto the altar. And don't forget that in those days, water was a scarce commodity, especially in Yerushalayim. It had to be, uh, was taken from deep wells. The Shiloach, we know that it had to be um, had to be somehow brought onto Temple Mount. It wasn't a simple matter. Water is, is a scarce commodity even today, but then it was much harder for them to get it. And they would pour all this water. And what was the idea? The idea is that on Sukkot we pray for water. And the water that we pray for is demonstrated through the water that we have on Sukkot. And somebody who hasn't seen Simcha Space Sha'eva in their life has never really experienced joy. That's what Chazal tell us. The, the joy of seeing water and, and in such quantities and knowing that we're davening and that we are being judged for water and that the rainfall of the coming few months over the winter season that's going to lead ultimately to the harvest of the spring, that that is always all being judged on Sukkot. It's a central theme. So listen carefully. Shlach lachmacha alpnei hamoyim. Somehow the bread, which represents tav or desire, is being thrown into the water, which somehow connects to Sukkot. V'chag ha-Sukkot shu alpnei hamoyim. Pir shenidoinin boy ala mayim. On the on Sukkot, we are judged as to how much water we're going to receive in rain over the coming few months. Our lovely Skadish binyan there. That's that's the time when we really have to purify ourselves, to sanctify ourselves in terms of tava, in terms of our desires. We have to nullify our desires. Throw the bread into the water. Just kind of let go. You're letting go of your tava into the water of Sukkot, into this great moment of praying for water on Sukkot, of being judged for water on Sukkot, somehow will make its way back to you. Having that trust in Hashem, knowing that Hashem is all-powerful, do you know what's going to happen? Whatever it is you get, you'll get back, because Hashem will give it to you. It's a beautiful interpretation of this posuk. The blessings that you will find for the entire year will be as a result of this, of this that you've done over Sukkot. So now we have to connect it in an even stronger way to Sukkot. And let's see what the Nesivas Shalom says. The Dalat Haminim is the connecting, is the catalyst that brings all of these elements together. How does it do it? Because each one of the Arba Minim is connected to aspects of the human body that relate to the Tavis, to the human desires that we are discussing. The eye sees and the heart desires. The heart is the seat of emotions and desires. That's the idea. So if the eye sees... And the heart wants, that's what, that's what Tava is. Halulav connected Hashedra. What's the Lulav? The Lulav connects to the spine, as we know, it correlates to the spine. What is the spine? Earlier this week, when I was saying this over, we had a neurologist among us. And, I, and, and he agreed with this Nasiba Shalom. It's a fascinating interpretation. The spine is what connects the brain to all the parts of the body. Because without the spine, I mean, the brain may exist in your head, but it doesn't, it can't do, it can't control anything. The spine is what takes all the messages of the brain and sends them to all the different parts of the human body so that we can do whatever it is that we do, even in our heads. Our heads only operate because of the brain and every aspect of the brain has to be somehow communicated to us. And you know that the spine has the spinal cord. And the spinal cord is the source of everything that it is we do, which is why, of course, if you, if a human being has their neck broken, they die, even though the brain is, is fully functioning, as it were. But without the, the connection of the spinal cord to the brain, the body can do nothing. So the spine is the source of taking everything that in our brain we want to do and enabling that to happen physically, materially. Va'arova, what about the arova? Well, the arova is simple. Domela pe. We said it's like a mouth. Remez letavos ha'achila. 
It's all the things that we eat. All the things that we put in our mouth are the things that relate to this tava, to this desire. And there's a huge desire that comes in terms of eating. It's, you know, we, we have to eat all the time. We're constantly hungry. If we didn't eat for a few hours, it doesn't matter how big the meal was a few hours ago you're still going to be hungry a few hours later. And if you didn't eat for two, three days, you're starving. So the mouth is, uh, it relates to this idea of needing to eat, the desire, the human desire to eat. Now, our duty is on Sukkot, this time of connecting the Mayim, this central theme of, of the holiday of Sukkot, of the festival of Sukkot, is Mayim. We take all the aspects of the human condition, we dedicate them to Hashem, so that everything we do in terms of, of the human desire, of the things that we want to do and that we need to do, or that we feel desire to do, is connected to Hashem, that we don't just do them for ourselves selfishly. That's what the Arba Minim are all about. These holy days of Sukkot, You'll be able to purify yourself from all aspects of the human desires that naturally occur during the course of the year by dedicating yourself to sanctifying them through the Arba Minim. You will somehow give yourself a layer of protection so you won't immediately fall into the traps of the desires that you have immediately after the Yomim Naroim and as the year progresses. Ad Until it's going to be true to say that every single part of me, the human being, is able to express themselves by saying, Hashem mi chamoicha. V'oid Isa, the Chazal. There's another Chazal and uh, it's also in the same Medrash and it's a very familiar one. I told you we'd have another familiar one from when we were children and here it is. And it's Be'inyan Dalet Haminim. Esreg yesh bo'y tam be'yesh bo'y reach. You know, Esreg has a tam and it, a taste, a flavor. And it also has a scent, a beautiful scent. I can smell it here. The, uh, it has a, a, you can smell it and you can taste it. It's a fruit and it's also a source of a beautiful scent. Um, lulav betamra yesh tam ve'y bo'reach. Lulav it comes from the um, date palm. The dates... They don't smell of anything, but they taste lovely. It's a fruit. Hadas, yesh bo'y reach ve'en bo'y tam. The hadas, the myrtle, has a scent, but it has no flavor. You're not eating eating anything coming from the myrtle plant. Arova, e'en bo'y tam ve'en bo'y reach. And the arova has a no tam, no flavor. There's nothing to eat in the arova. It's not tasty, and you can't smell it. It has no scent. So these... Four different combinations are represented by the Arba Minim. And we can explain through this something that is said by the Maharal. The Maharal says something very beautiful. And he says, That's number one. And Sholem Im Atzmai. Three things. You have to be complete content, as it were, with your creator. Similarly, with all the people around you, all the people you mix with, with humanity. And the third thing is with yourself. In and of yourself, you have to be sholem, complete, content. These three things are the essential um, aspects of ensuring that you are a healthy person. You are healthy because you are sholem with Hashem, you're healthy because you are sholem with humanity and you're healthy because you are sholem with yourself in and of yourself. Okay, and we're going to use this idea of the Arba Minim to expand on this maharal, this beautiful maharal. Now let's, let's examine this a little bit more closely. Let's, let's look at... Um, our relationship with Hashem. I'm not going to read it inside. You can look at it inside. The source sheet is available on my website or on SoundCloud, on YouTube. You can take a look inside. He says something extraordinary. He says, you know that in your relationship with Hashem, there are moments when it's got tam and it's got reach. Whatever that may mean to you. That means it's got tam. Maybe it's because you feel like you want, you've 
want to do it. And it's got reach, it's something that you enjoy doing as well. It's fabulous. I want to do this mitzvah and I enjoy doing this mitzvah and I understand why I need to do it. I'm totally into it, etc. Then there's times when it's got tam, but it's got no reach. That means I understand why I need to do it. I just don't feel like doing it. I'm just not in the mood. Then there's a mitzvah, which has got reach, but no tam. It, the reach is, I don't mind doing it, but I've got no idea why I'm doing it. Then you've got mitzvahs, which have got no tam and no reach. I've got no idea why I'm doing it, and I don't really want to do it. Now, in your relationship with Hashem, do you know what? There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be times when there's tam and reach. There's going to be times when there's reach and no tam. There's going to be times when there's tam and no reach. There's going to be times when there's no tam and no reach. But either way, you've got to be sholem. There's got to be consistency. And whatever it is, that's a big bracha, by the way. The biggest bracha is that whatever it is, I'm still doing it. I'm still on the right path. I'm still carrying out what it is that I need to do. That's with Hashem. Now, think about human beings. There's people who are great to be with and you understand them, you really get on with them. Then there's people who are great to be with, but you don't really get them. You know, there's, there's aspects of their personality which you're not too happy with, but they're fun to be with. Then there's people who are really boring, but you know that it's good to be with them. And then there's people who are actually not that exciting to be with, and they're not great people, and you don't want to be with them. But you know what it says in the Torah? It says, You have to love every single person. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter in what state they are. It doesn't matter what you think about them, how you feel towards them, what your emotions are at that particular moment in time. Do you hear this? Tam reach, tam no reach, reach no tam, no tam no reach. You have to be sholem with every single person. Ah, now we come to an aspect of this idea which is so forward and so modern in terms of psychology as we understand it today. It's incredible that the Maharal and even the Nesiva Sholem, they come up with this brilliant idea that's so perfectly encapsulated by the message that we're trying to give through the Arba Minim, through Sukkot. Listen carefully. Human being, there's times when you're feeling great and you are great and you're happy in, in yourself. There's times not so happy, but if things are okay. There's times when things aren't okay, but you're actually, you know, you're feeling in a good mood. There's times when you're really depressed and you can't find a way out of it. It's four different levels. It's tam and reach. It's tam and no reach. It's reach and no tam. And it's no tam and no reach. But it doesn't matter what it is. You've got to be sholem with yourself. You've got to find that inner equilibrium. You've got to find that inner peace. In order to be a complete person, you've got to be sholem with Hashem. You've got to be sholem with your chaverim. And you've got to be sholem inside yourself. That is a healthy person. That's represented by the Arba Minim. Isn't it fascinating? Isn't it beautiful? And it's Kamamar Chazal says, the Nesiva Sholem. It's like it says, Chazal tell us, Evet Ivri Oyved, Bein Bayoim or Bein Balayla. And Evet Ivri has to work for his master, whether it's day or whether it's night. What does it mean? Even when it's very bright, the sun is shining as it should. Or when the sun has set and it's dark. Doesn't make a difference. The Evet Ivri, and we are all, in a sense, Evet Ivri to Hashem. We have to work. You've got to be able to be complete in every single one of those situations. You cannot make any distinction in terms of your service to Hashem, even when it's dark for you. And so it goes on. And so it goes on. This idea is so beautiful that you take the lulav and the estrog and you think of being sholem in front of Hashem. Everything is together, by the way. We don't shake them separately. You can't just take the estrog and shake it on its own and take the lulav and shake it on its own. No, we bring them together. Everybody is together. 
Everything is together. Every aspect of the human condition is together. It's all one big mix. There's sometimes when you're on a high and things are great. Sometimes you're on a low and things are not so great. Bring it all together. It all melds into one human life. That's who we are. And that's what we do immediately after Yom Kippur. We take the Lulav. We take the Estrid. We take the Hadas and we take the Arabes and we say, we're going to be Sholem in front of Hashem and we are going to be happy. Every aspect of our lives, the things we're not too keen on, the things we're crazy about, they all have to come together into one big picture. We have to see them that way so that we can tackle the rest of the year as we have to. So, Bezel and this is what it says, you take it on the first day, this is the first moment that you have after Yom and Arayim where you can think about how are my actions going to be over the coming year? I'll tell you, they're going to be all over the place because that's who I am. I'm not consistent. Sometimes I wake up and I'm feeling great. Sometimes I wake up, I'm feeling groggy. I need two coffees. Sometimes I don't need any coffee. But it makes no difference. We bring it all, to- all together. Shekashe mitchilas shona chadosho maschil cheshben avoinos. If you start off the year knowing that, having a really broad sense of what the coming year is going to be, um, Hashem gives us this incredible gift of the Arba Minim so that we can understand what it is that our job, that our journey is going to be in the coming year and that we embark on that journey in the proper way so that we're ready for everything that we're going to encounter in the months ahead. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for listening. We'll leave it here. Have a wonderful Yom Tov. Thank you.